Okay, today on the buy round, we are joined by none other than the living legend that is Gordon Tallis. But before we get into that, I just want to give a big shout out to the blo for, to the blokes at Bloke in the Bar for letting us use the studio. Grab a case at your local liquor establishment, wherever you get your cases from, Bloke in the Bar. It's a really, really good drop of beer. Have you had it before, Gordy? Had it before. I buy it from the Caxton Hotel. It's one of my locals. On draft there? Just down the road from the from uh, Triple M, so when I finish on a Sunday, pull in, have a bloke, and go home. But we're always on till six fifteen. I tell my wife, yeah, <laughs> like that, like that one the old, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. darling, mate, Charlie White wouldn't let us off. Yeah, I, I know the feeling. Just if in doubt, just blame Charlie. But um, Matt, I just want to just want to say thank you again for joining us here on the buy round, mate. You are undoubtedly one of the toughest players to ever play our sport. So you've done it all in the game. Um, and I, I've, got, I've got a confession to make. I, I still get a bit starstruck and a bit nervous in your, in your company because I've never told you this before, but when I was a kid around the early 2000s, you and the Broncos players, you had, do you remember those, um, those black and, and orange Nike boots that you had? Yeah. I had a pair of them because you guys wore them and you wore them specifically. Yeah, wow. So it's still, it's still like a bit strange for me to think that that's who I once was, that I looked up to you. They were my favourite boots. They were good, weren't they? Yeah, successful yeah. in that. Yeah, yeah the, in the, the Nike the, boot, and, yeah. And met being a ginger. It it's, a, it's a big call to go with orange on your boots. Like, it's a big <laughs> call, man. I, I have to admit. Yeah. But it was one I was... You look like a licorice all sorts. Yeah, it, it was one I was willing to take because you and the rest of the Broncos players wore them. So yeah, well. um, it's funny and it's strange for me to be sat here thinking back to that 14, 15-year-old that would be like, wow. Like, Well, there you go. Well, you know, when I was about... I think about 12, the English side came and toured and they played in Townsville and it was Des Drummond and Henderson Gill yeah. and those guys and they played that series against Australia where he got up and yeah, did, he did the boot. And they, yeah, <laughs> like did that boot. So like it was just, you know, there's some things as a kid that just draws you to it and it might yeah. be the jersey, the player um, or whatever and you know, that's the greatest thing about our game and it's the Benji Marshall flick pass mm. or the Lockie and then every kid I think will have one of those moments. Yeah, it's know? funny, isn't it? Because I guess when you're playing, you don't realize it, but you, you do have an effect on youngsters. You are a, I don't like the term role model, but- No, you're you, not a you, role you, model. You, it's, yeah. it's, I always say that because, you know, Princess Mary was here in Australia. She was a Tasmanian that sold real estate in the Eastern suburbs, met Prince Frederick. Now she's a princess, there's no textbook. Yeah. And now she's a role model. No, she's a she's a young girl from Tasmania that happened to fall in love with a guy. She's not a princess. Yeah. That's her title, but there's no, you know, so people might aspire to be her, but she's not the role model. Her 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 mum is her role model. Her dad is her role model. And I've been really strong on that. And with my kids, they can look up to a sportsman, but he's not your role model. So what he does is not always right and wrong because he's playing because I saw myself when I'd get sent off and all those things, it's part of me that I'm still a bit embarrassed today is I didn't think of the young kid sitting on the couch with their dad. I was in the moment yeah. and you've been in the yeah. moment and yeah. you don't think of my kids sitting there watching the footage or whatever. So um, as a role model, I think it's a term loosely. I think yeah. people look up to you, they can inspire to be you, but your role models must be closer and have you must have day-to-day -day contact with a role model. Absolutely you should. Yeah. Absolutely, you shouldn't. I guess, I, you know, I was the same. I w was never thinking of uh, of the people at home, but but also when I when I think about people that you know put sports stars on such a pedestal, I, I think it's it's I think it's dangerous how we treat them um, from a media point of view because it's okay to make mistakes, yeah. and you should e even your role your quote unquote role models they make mistakes as well, and it's okay because you. You improve, you change things, but I, I don't think that message is is put across enough. And, and in terms of you, Gordy, I I don't think you should be you shouldn't be ashamed of of of, of the person you were when you, you you played. I don't think you should be hard on your former self. Yeah. From what you know, you, you wear who you wear, and it's got you into position now that you that you can reflect and go, ah, oh, 
Nah, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm the same. Like, I reflect and go, oh, that's a bit. Yeah, I, I always say there's... N- I think there's too many bad people in the world. There's some bad decisions and mistakes that you make, but there's not a bad person that wants to go out there and do all that kind of stuff. Yeah, know? there's not many people that are motivated by being malevolent. It's yeah. generally yeah. you want to do good things, but, yeah. you know. And there's so, a split second. Yeah, shit happens, right? And It does happen. We live and we live and learn. Just just on that a little bit, mate, your, your character and your, and your personality, so... The Gordon Tallis we we witnessed on on the rugby league field, in that zone, in that moment, the most fierce competitor, someone that was willing to, I imagine, do anything within the constraints of, in certain constraints, like yep. to to win f- for your team. But then, you know, a lot of people listening to this, they they might not have. They might not know you as that person. And, you know, I've seen that person. But then also now the person that you are now where you come across in, in the media so so just so calmly and that and almost like a a voice of of reason. <laughs> and you obviously I was an emotional guy watching you play, that emotion came in, but then yeah. you're very considered as well and you think things through. Is that just, is that naturally happen with age or was that when you were playing as well, you were that type of personality and then you cross the line and you become this, you become the player, the man? Yeah, I did. It was, they call it white line fever for a lack of a better term and an understanding of who that guy is. And I used to take a little fluffy white dog Tyson that if you put a stick in its back, it's a mop. Like I had a little Maltese that weighed 3.7 kilos and I'd walk him down a dog park on game day, go back, have a bit of banana bread and go to the game. So that's, so which Gordon tell us, or the one then that stands there and is prepared to take on the whole team. But mentally I had to get to that guy. You know, mentally I had to build myself up to be that person on the field. Then when things went away, it got quicker. But basically I had to build myself up to try to be tough and all that and get it out of myself. I know it sounds funny, for someone, but um, that wasn't my natural persona. Like, I had yeah. to be pushed and prod, you know? Like, I'm happy just walking along at my own beat. Well, you, you knew who you had to be because to, I get the, to get the desired outcome, right? We like, spoke about it the other day, Jimmy, and then I would have loved to have been a 5'8". I would have loved to have been Wally Lewis or Darren Lockyer, Andrew Johns. But when you don't have that skill level, they just keep on moving you in. Like, yeah. how good would it be? So if you go to the Olympics and you're running the marathon... No one's watching it. They just watch someone put a – seriously, they they watch someone put the medal on your neck and go, oh, that bloke won the marathon. But Usain Bolt, there's a build-up. You know? So they're the, they're the stars. You mm. know? And forwards you can go and you can make 40 tackles, you can have 20 great runs like a Tino Fasu or Malawi, and they talk about a winger scoring a hat-trick. Yeah. So for me to get to that position, I just kept on getting pushed up and – when I first went to the Dragons, they wanted to make me a front rower. And that's one position on the field that I thought I was better than. Because I think, <laughs> that's the end of the tunnel. And that's not a that's not bagging. I'm thinking, Mate. there's nowhere to go other than front row. I can't go anywhere else. So if I can stay in the back row on an edge and not even get into the middle, at least I'm halfway between where I wanted to be and where I'm going to go in the end. Because I'm thinking, as I get slower and older and can't, control my weight, oh, mate, I'm happy to go in there. But I didn't want to start in there as a 20-year-old. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I had not too dissimilar aspirations, Gordon, to have a life on the edge. But um, those dreams were quashed by uh, Daniel Anderson, actually. He uh, he came in at St. Helens and said, uh, mate, you're back in the team this week. You, you're off the bench. Guess where you're coming on at? I was like, oh, maybe, maybe a bit of edge. He's like, no, <laughs> you're you are front row, my friend. So forget about it. And I was like, oh, okay. So, um, but he, he he was he was great for me. But yeah, I I think there was a bit of a stigma about playing front row. But the, yeah, there the, was. I, I know lads that when I was coming through, you know, the, their dads would say to the coach, he he's not playing prop. I, legitimately, yeah, like right. you know, the, the the better kid, and they thought me. No, no, he's not playing prop. I can, I can distinctly remember there's a couple of lads that 
were probably built for playing front row, but no, because it was a strange. It, it's strange, though, isn't it? Like, because I guess maybe the, the the monetary side of things, the front rowers maybe perhaps never used to get paid that much, but now it's yeah. it's in vogue. I'd say, would you think that the highest paid front row would be on more than the highest paid edge well, back row? Like now? Well, it was in vogue when I first came in. It was Glenn Lazarus. It was Ian Roberts. It was like it wasn't a position that wasn't famous. I mean, there was Blocker Race, there was Arthur Beeson, there was yeah. all the greats that played front row, Greg Dowling, Marty Bella. They were getting all the raps. For me, because I hadn't played it as a kid. Yeah, okay. And maybe and maybe that was my bad because of the way I viewed that position more than getting in there. Mate, I might have enjoyed it and I loved every moment, but when I first went into it and I'm running and there's Paul Harrigan and there's Mark Glenville, then there's Ian Roberts and Smen Gillespie, then there's... You know, John Lomax and Quentin Pongia, then there's Glenn Lazarus and Andrew G. And I'm like, man, I'm, I'm not that guy. Like, <laughs> what's wrong? And then you see Stephen Menzies and all these guys out. I'm like, that's more. Yeah, me. Give, me, give me a bit yeah, more of that. Yeah, give me a bit more of that mm. kind of stuff. So, so I think it was somewhere in the middle. Mm. I thought I could go in there and be a front rower at times. I could never be a Steve Menzies, but I thought at times I could, you know, drift a bit wider yeah. as well. Um, just in terms of switching into game mode, when did that start for you? When when in the week? Did or, or, or was it just literally like? Can you talk me through that? Um, in the week, I'd build up, and more importantly for me, it was about training and touching every line. So that's one thing that I had to tell myself at training. It was all about diet, getting the right amount of sleep, and touch every line. Once I did that mentally, I was ready for the battle and I'd go to a bit of boxing or something if I thought that my lungs didn't blow I'd you know go and what do, what do you mean by touch every line well you know people you know how you got to run to the end of the field or they tell you to warm up and go touch the line and come back and people fall that much short mm. I could never do that yeah in my own head because I feel like that I wasn't preparing you myself didn't cheat I, yourself I got to touch every line I didn't yeah. have to win everything because I because I didn't win everything but I made sure that I touched every line and then when I got to the dressing room, um, it was fine. I just made sure that I wasn't playing the game in my head. I wasn't a guy they could think about too much. Then when I was out there, naturally it would happen because through the week I'm listening and I'm talking to my players and I'm working on the stuff. So I knew the plan that I wanted to have in my head and it was against the guys that I was playing against. When I, funny, I could run on and I'd put my mouth guard in. And once I'd bit down on it hard, it was like, I'm ready. I'm here, I'm here. I'm ready. And then they'd kick off and then I just wanted to go. And then my first collision, I, I didn't care who I run at, but I would run at, I'd be running straight and I'd change my angle. So I made the collision, not them hitting me. You dictated it. Dictated uh, the battle. And then after the first hit, you were sort of into yeah. the, you are like, are you into it? And then um, I suppose when I was at my best, it had to be personal with me. So towards the end when I was losing it, I had to... Like early, it was personal because you're making it and you're in mm. the battle and you're in that. As you got older and people left you alone, there wasn't that little niggle or that. You know what I mean? Like you and Sam Burgess had niggle. You were always up for that. You knew mm. where you had to go. But when you're not playing against Sam Burgess, how do you get up? Mm. It's funny how certain people would just get bring you out up. the best, bring out the best in you, don't they? they because you know that you got to be yeah. physically ready, and then. Mm. When there's not that player or that team against you, sometimes you just float away and just go through the motion. So I always had to try to challenge, and if it was a big game, I would have to make it personal. It could be a really good fella on the other side. Yeah. But I had to get under his skin and rough him up and have him say something, and then it's like, yeah, okay, get, oh, you're, you're right, let's go. The confrontate, you, br you, you had bring out the confrontation, yeah. Because otherwise I'm just going. Yeah. Uh, so it had to be confrontational. Yeah. What about in, in, in training? You know, you, you talk about that, that getting onto the field. What what type of trainer were you? Were, were you were you running like you did in the game at no, training? No, that Shane, no Shane Webke did. Um, Brad Thorne was 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 very much like those guys trained a bit harder than me, like full on at training. Mm. Like suppose if you put it in boxing terms, they that was a really hard spa where I like just going through the motions, but just at 70%. Mm. Did anyone 60. ever tick you off at all? Did it ever boil over? Oh, yeah, it? Webby, yeah, yeah, Shane. So I tried but to stay with, away but from... With, but with you, like, did he ever find you or...? Yeah, 
Like, he annoyed me a couple of times. I hit him at training one day and he went flying back and he got up and then Wayne said, come over here, boys, you know, because we were, like, at each other, you know, and then, you know, like, if it's a wrestle and his head hits you or he goes a bit hard, you, like, you get into it and then it's on and him and Thorny and, you know, like, there's bloods, like, he and Thorny would hit heads or Tony Carroll. Like, we had a – training at the Broncos in my era was pretty much sometimes harder than the games that I played as in preparing because – I wasn't right up for the training yeah, session. Yeah, yeah. You go out there and you go on 75%. And next minute, someone might be going 80. Mm. Someone might be going 85 or someone might be going 90. At least at the game, you know, everybody's going 100, right? You know the speed limit. But at training, sometimes I'd be at 60 or whatever. And when they hit you and you didn't like it. So as you get older, you know not to get in mm. certain battles and you do that. And I was working on my passing game a little bit more. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't even have a passing game, but I'd work on it because I didn't want that. I I knew what I had yeah, to do on Sunday, save, not what I had save to do. Yourself. But but to Shane Webke's credit, and we all knew he had to be like that Monday. He had to be like that Tuesday. Everything he did, even on his day off, he'd go for a five k run because he needed that, like the touch every line. Mm. So as a teammate, I had to engage it, but I didn't like it. Yeah, and yeah, you, you have to respect that, don't you? Absolutely, that that's their way of maintaining their standards yes. and we're we're all different and th yeah. i think that's the, what the best coaches understand it's not it's not one way or my way it's yeah. okay let's okay gordon you need this to be your best self on a weekend okay Absolutely. you know shane webke you need to do this okay so we'll yeah. we'll well, we'll, man we'll manage that yeah because when i was at the dragons brian smith it was everyone in a round hole even if you're square yeah. or triangle or whatever and it sort of worked for me because I was young and it taught me a hell of a lot and I would never change my career. I always wanted to learn what I learned under Brian Smith and it made me some of the player that, um, that I was. And when he went to Brisbane and after a couple of years, Steve Renouf, if it got really hot and hard, he'd go off. And I know he had diabetes and all that and he was, you know, he was a little bit different. But I said to Wayne one day, I said, why isn't he doing the rest of the fitness? He goes, when you score his tries, you can go off as well. Wayne just let me know then and there that there's different rules for different people. And then yeah. I learned at that moment that that's cool. And then as you get older and as I got into that realm and then he go, mate, go, mate, go have an early shower. They're going to do extra wrestling or whatever they were doing. So he didn't treat everybody equal, but you felt good when you were in that group or getting selected. And sometimes you go, oh, no, Wayne, I need a little bit extra. Some days you would take it. It all depends how you're feeling, but he normally picked it spot on, Wayne, like it, the old cager. Yeah, he, he did seem to have that knack of that. Even did he the, do that to you? With, with the England teams, yeah. It, you know, it, and, uh, and I think that, you know, it's kind of funny. I've been in, been in teams where it's like, okay, this is our team standards, yep. but realistically you know that some people aren't in the team to do that, to do those little one percenters. See, I think the best teams complement one another. Absolutely. Like I said, like, you know, I can't do what you do. You don't do what, what I do. Being a good teammate or being in a good team doesn't mean everyone doing the same job. It means doing different jobs at your best ability and finding the ways to complement one another, bring out the best within each other. And, yeah, you've got to take it that some will take all the glory, like a Steve yeah. Renouf. And, you know, there might have been time. But as long as you know it, you, you're not going, oh, look at him, he, he barely trains, but he gets all the glory. You're going, mate, I bring my best self, he brings his best hey, self. It wasn't happening in any important games. That never happened when we were playing a final, when we're mm. going into the finals. Everybody's on the same page and everybody does the one percentage. But it was yeah. through the year managing yeah. the expectation, yeah. managing their workload... And some people just need a time off and they had kids and all that. Yeah, and as you learn and but just listening to you talk, I hear a coach in there. In me? Yeah. Oh, I don't know, Gordon. Do you have the patience? Um I just don't know. I, I don't I don't know I don't know if I can go all in on it. Because you have to be all in. Yeah. I, I part of me I'd love to, but I'm frightened of who I'd become again. Like I've been mad. I've already been mad. I think the game needs that. But do I? Good question. Only you know the answer yeah. to that. But I, I, you know, I think the game needs needs a bit of dinosaur in it. 
and what I mean by that is some old standards that have that have left our game. That's the reason why Wayne Bennett is still part of our game at 70. That's the reason why Tim Sheen's what's old again is new. Mm. And the game doesn't realise that yet. And the bosses and the people that run the clubs don't realise that yet. The mm. players are running it because this is what they want. You know, the GPS, the 4Ks yeah. and all that. Not, you know, sometimes, um, sometimes I love being told what to do. I love being... Yelled at. I loved being pushed to my limit and seeing how far the human body or how yeah. far you could go as a team, as a unit, um, as an individual. And I don't think you're allowed to get that anymore out of your players because you end up being picked on or it's unfair because you pushed him and you embarrassed him in front of his teammates or whatever or you made him do mm. it again. That's the era what I grew up in. Yeah, I think you, you quickly... You ki- you quickly understand that that's the way it is for the greater good, right? You you, yeah. you you're that way because this is our way of getting the results on 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 a Sunday or on a weekend. In my in my opinion, but and they say, oh, the people don't respond to that. As far as I know, people still make the humans the same way, don't they? Last time I checked, yeah, yeah, thought so. Yeah. <laughs> um, before we. Before we um, delve a bit more into into your career, I just want to ask you about growing up in in Townsville, um, and just how the sport got its hold on you um, as a youngster. Well, it was, I suppose, in Townsville there was a, a couple of sports: um, basketball. Uh, my family played basketball. My sisters were really good at basketball. Had a sister that represented her. Uh, one of her old teammates is the Australian coach, actually, Sandy Brondello and coaches the Lakers women's side. and So we would always spend our time at basketball. So I'd play basketball, but I was often five fouls all the time because <laughs> I, just, I just wanted the ball. So basketball wasn't, it was a bit like Greece when Danny Risse goes and can't play any sport. That's a pretty much was my upbringing. But when I found rugby league and we'd go down there because dad was so involved in coaching and, that, and I was a ball boy and blokes like Gene Miles, Colin Scott, Greg Dowling, Sam Backer, all these guys, they were all playing in the Townsville competition or in the Foley Shield, which was the Greater North Queensland comp. Quickly I realised that that's the sport. And it was everybody's sport. There's no, you know how you go, like there's a class, probably in England, mm. soccer, then there's rugby union and there's cricket and it's where you're brought up. In North Queensland, everybody was rugby league. So um, it wasn't a class thing. It was just the community's game and it still is now. Like when you go up to North Queensland, it's, it's everybody's game and... For me to go play it, it was um, – mum wouldn't let me play it um, until I turned eight. So because I wanted to play because my brother was a bit older, so he joined a couple of years before me and I really wanted to play. But she made me wait until I was the right age group and I loved every game. I loved every moment. The seasons couldn't go long enough. I played for the school, played for the club. Um, would go to the sports reserve, Townsville Sports Reserve, on the weekend and be the ball boy and the sand boy and just couldn't get enough of yeah. it. Just could not get enough of rugby league, and probably because at the time Gene Miles was a Townsville boy, he was playing for Winner Manly. He was having a successful go. Colin Scott, my dad, had a little bit to do with him um, growing up, and Wally Lawson. Winner Manly was such a force, and South was Mel Meninga and all these guys. And as they were coming up through the ranks, I was getting more involved in rugby league. So, and Townsville it was everybody's game. How good is that when you just? That phrase, you just can't get enough. You just I couldn't get enough. Yeah, like you, yeah. It's it's a, it's a special time in in a youngster's life that when you just and you too. Oh, mate, I I think there was a phase there where I was you know training Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, not Friday, play Saturday and Sunday, and and I double up for more. I, I just could not get enough. It was so mate, it was so much fun. It was just fun. It was love. Like, why well, wouldn't I want to do it? And that's and that's why. Yeah, people ask me, and and I'll say it, and I believe it, and it's my whole career. I played for free. I got paid to train because, <laughs> like, like I did. So to turn up in October yeah. when there's no one around and you're running, you know, through through the Gap Reservoir in Brisbane at the back, and it's hot, and Wayne's yelling at you, or you're doing four hundred, and Craig Bellamy or whoever. You're doing weights and all those things and you're waking up sore just from weights and mm. 
and training and you and you and you and you toughening up your body or so suppose they break it down and put it back together yeah you know for the for the 12 weeks you know just to get you right mentally right for the season that's what they paid mm. me for yeah the rest you know was just free like sundays you just it was so good and that's when i knew when i was retiring because i was driving to a game and i drove past the paddo tavern in brisbane and it was a beautiful day and i was never ever wanted to be anywhere else but wanted kickoff. I wanted to be out there, and you know, just that moment, that two, mm. th- that that two minute warning, run on the field and play. And I drove past a beautiful day, and I saw all these blokes drinking schooners, and I thought, how good would that be? Yeah. And that's when I knew. But I was past it at that time. I'm thinking, so that's when I realised if I didn't want to be there, mm. it's time to hang them yeah. up. Yeah. And just in Townsville as well, you, you your dad has a. Yeah. Stan named after him, doesn't he? So yeah, uh, a street actually. Named a street. After him. Yeah, yeah. It's it's fantastic. It's like he was a big humble guy. He's a big indigenous guy. He was the first ever indigenous captain to leave this country. He went to New Zealand and captained um, the Aboriginal All Blacks. And he was a cricket player. He was a basketballer. Played AFL. Got offered. Uh, he went down and I think had a had a trial match with St Kilda. Went and played for Lee. Yes, I read it, yeah. Yeah, Lee in England, the Centurions. Yeah, they? that's right. So, yeah. um, so when I go to uh, England in the World Cup, I want to go and follow some of his footsteps and make sure that I go and have a beer in all the bars over there and ask some punters whether they remember him. But um, And then in North Queensland, um, the greatest thing about when I was growing up, I was Wally and Judah's son. I was never, and even now when I go home, I'm still Wally's boy. I'm not yeah. Gordon Tallis, the footy player. So um, he made an imprint and... They had a um, like a survey or a competition to see who the streets get named after, and Dad's name come up. So it's uh, it's pretty special. I think that's Mum's mum, and I think the whole family. That's our proudest moment. I think because Dad never said anything, never said one word about any of his career. You've always someone else has to tell you what he's done, mm. which is totally different to his boys. <laughs> 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 it's totally different. Just, <laughs> but it's pretty cool. Yeah, and. One of the things he he, he did say to you, because I've, I've heard you speak about this, and it's it's incredible you took the stance yeah. when you when you had a year out because it's hard to envisage anyone doing that today. But even back then, mate, that that was something you should be. I think talk about being proud. I, th- I think it's important you stood for something when you decided to to set out for a year. Well, I do carry his name, right? That's Dad's name, the mm. one that was guiding me around. But on the other side of the fence, St George put a stick in the ground as well. That was the standards that they were setting for the club. And it was different times, Super mm. League. And when they drove the stick in the sand and I'm arguing and will I play, won't I play, and then I was going to go back and I went and had a meeting with the family. Well, it's not a meeting. It's never a meeting. I, I went home to have dinner with Mum and Dad and... We were talking and said, oh, mum, I might go back. And dad goes, I said, what do you think, dad? He goes, what did you say? I said, oh, well, if I can't play for Brisbane, I'm going to sit out there. He goes, all oh, right, so is that what you said? I said, yeah. He just be a man of your word. And to me, that was the end of it. And to this day, you know, whether I was going to or not, it stopped any doubt in my head. It stopped all the rubbish and the to and fro in the grey area. Am I letting St George down? Am I letting Brisbane down? Am I going to come back? I made a decision. I said it, and it was a silly quote in the paper because, you know, are you going to go back and play? And a journalist stood in front of me with a microphone, and obviously I've got foot and mouth disease because I don't think that often. And I just said, well, if I can't play for the Broncos, I won't play. It happened to be a throwaway line, but it just kept on getting thrown out there. So once it snowballed, I had to stand up to what I said. As small as what it might have been at the time, a throwaway line, it taught me a lot. Because that day, right, when I was walking the streets of Brisbane and I realised that when I retired, no one really cares. No one, no one actually gives a shit. Right? Once the lights get turned down on you. So I realised that when I was playing, enjoy the moment, but it ain't going to last forever, where some people struggle in retirement. I knew then because I half retired early because I had a year off. Yeah, I just went to Brisbane. I hadn't played a game for Brisbane. I'm walking the streets and no one cared. Yeah. Pretty much now. So it was a really good lesson. So the next part of my year, uh, 
next part of my journey was the Broncos. I made sure I enjoyed it, but don't take yourself too serious. Yeah. It's important message that don't take yourself too seriously. Yeah, so, yeah. so out of out of sitting out of a you know sitting out of a year of rugby league, it actually set me up from thirty to forty nine, yeah. where I'm comfortable. Yeah. Just one last thing on the on the dragons. You you fight with them. Um, Ryan Smith or the, the near fight with Ryan Smith. Can you tell us about that? It's, it's funny because you know, we talk about players and not liking coaches or whatever. Mm. I didn't go out and go and ring a journalist or go ask someone in the media. Brian Smith said something. There was Nathan Brown was really good for my career and so was Anthony Mundine, Noel Goldthorpe and the, you know, like the younger guys at the Dragons. The older guys were really good as well but they were the ones that were driving us to train and get some good standards. And I think we trained Tuesday. Wednesday was an optional speed work session. And speed work wasn't everybody's cup of tea back then. I thought, look, I'm going to go. So Brian Smith goes, well, whoever's going to go, put your hand up. I think about six blokes put their hand up. He goes, well, there's enough. We'll get the speed coach in. I forgot my mum was flying from, um, in from towns, and I think I'd seen her since Christmas. I'm like, oh, God, mum's coming. I've got to go pick her up. So I borrowed the old, I think we had a Sigma in the car, so I went to pick mum up, drove there to the airport, picked her up, got the training on Thursday, and Brian Smith was right. Well, I think there might have been only three guys there instead of the six. He said, where were you? And he was talking to me. I said, oh, sorry, I had to pick up mum from the airport. I just forgot about it. He goes, what, so is she going to help you on the weekend? Is she? Because that was Brian Smith's way of talking. I said, mate, don't say that. I said, that's not fair. I said, I hadn't seen her for six months. My mum's more important yeah. than a sprint session. And he said, don't back chat me, son. I said, no, no, don't call me son. You're not good enough to be my father. So I'm pushing him as well, but I didn't like the way he, he mm. challenged me earlier. You know how I needed confrontation. It was happening. And he said something. I said, one more. I said, I'll get up and I'll knock you out. He said, that's it. Right? And then I just got the shits and I knew that I was going to lose it. So I just went home. And then I wasn't going to play. And then the boys, Brownie, I said, no, Brownie, he doesn't talk to me that way. No one does, right? And it wasn't talking to me. I took offence with my mum and mm. she going to help yeah, me play. And yeah. I just was protecting the people that I loved more than me. And anyway, to the point, Brian Smith ends up ringing me on Sunday morning. I said, I'll play. Don't ever give me another game plan. I'll play for the boys and nothing else. And to his credit, he said, yeah, sweet. And it's probably the seven best games I've ever played for the Dragons because the boys like that I come back to play from. And I liked that he gave me a chance. And then when we walked over after round 22, I think it was, and we're thanking the crowd, he, gave, he goes, thanks, mate. And that was probably the last time I spoke to him face to face. He, he probably had the fear of God into him as well. No, 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 mate. I was young and then yeah. I was wrong then, but I didn't go anywhere else. It was me and him having it out <coughs> yeah. as a, yeah. you know, as men. And that's what happened back in those days, mm. I suppose. You know, like it was, and Brian Smith, to his credit, he pushed buttons in me that, no other coach got to you know what i mean so it's pretty cool yeah. that he knew that there was a little insecure boy in there that loved his family and his mother and that's and then that's the reason why i played so he knew like when i play footy and i'm talking to people you got to find what makes you tick and mine was one of mum and dad to walk around the streets proud that's it there's no oh gordon tell that when mum went left the ground and she's happy and dad was proud and if he went to have a beer at the pub they go geez your son was good that's it for me. That's that's mm. the gold medal. And so he sort of said, is she going to help you? And him, I'm like, no, no, no. Keep them that's out That's my it. reason. Yeah, keep that's them out that, of it. That's my reason. So there. I'm going yeah. to get her. And then when mum's sitting in the crowd, I'm not going to play bad sort of thing. So, mm. so there you go. Yeah. Jeez, You're I'm pushing good. buttons like Brian Smith. Yeah. <laughs> 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 that bloody red and white yeah. jersey. Yeah. <laughs> right um, anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think it's probably a good job for... Brian Smith, he, he did shut up after that. Because, no, he, he, uh, no, I mean, I mean good. Yeah, yeah. No, but you know what? He he challenged everybody. Like he he was one of those guys. And now, like now, I'm 49. I know that. Mm. Now Mark Coyne knew it, and you know Scott Gourlay and Dave Barnell and Graham Bradley and Michael Potter, all those guys that were above me. They they had had those conversations, mm. and he's trying to find the best out of them. And maybe there was one or two, you know, conversations that went the wrong way. Didn't mean I didn't want to play good, and that's when I talk about, and of, and what I learned then is you didn't need a game plan to play good, because I never took one of his game plans again. I didn't even look at it. Mm. 
So I was stubborn. <laughs> but I know that if you want to play good for your teammates, you play good no matter what the coach says. It, it, it taught me. And now when I watch the game and people talk about this, I'm like, forget about it. Yeah. I, 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 know, the, I know the point you're making. I, I know the point you're making. It's Just like Sundays, mate. We don't have a rundown. Mm. We just go there and do our jobs, you know. Mm. If we had a good rundown, we'd be a better side. I know. Can you imagine if Charlie actually <laughs> pulled his finger out of his, uh, his backside and give us some info oh. or some, something to... Yeah, see, mate, this rundown's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, you <laughs> did it yourself. Did, did, I, I did, actually. <laughs> Shout out to producer Charlie for printing it off, at least. How about that? Um, anyway, mate, you, you go up to Brisbane and you... You win three premierships. Yeah. What what set that that team or that club apart? Like, how did you manage to achieve so much in such a, such a short period of time? When, when I was at <coughs> Brisbane, well, when I was a kid, I loved Brisbane, and they came into the competition, and my brother signed for, with the Broncos, and then I'm playing at the Dragons in 92, 93, 94, 95, and you play against Brisbane, and you watch, they were the first team to not wear their tracksuits, they had dress clothes, so they had really nice shirts and jeans and same boots and they just matched. And when they walked in, there was a presence. There was a presence when Brisbane walked in and then the way they'd sit there and someone would have someone would have their collar up or whatever and it was it was like they were arrogant. And it used to drive me to think, God, these blokes are arrogant because I knew some of the younger kids from being around North Queensland, like the Wendell Sailors and all that, I think, God, they're arrogant, this team. <laughs> then when I went to Brisbane and I realised that it wasn't arrogant, they trained harder than any footy side that I've ever been involved with and it was confidence. So, to, so don't mistake arrogance for confidence because they knew how good they were or how hard they've worked so they're not going to give anything up. So when they walked in, they knew who they were and um, to go there and... To get broken down in Brisbane and to train the way we did, uh, and a lot of it was under the Kelvin Giles regime, and he was a really tough trainer. I didn't get him, but I got the aftermath, and they didn't stop their standards. Mm. And there's a run at the gap, and it's about eight and a half k's, but the first hill's about I know it's nearly two k, and the boy said, "Just don't stop, mate." So I guess just don't stop, Lazo and the boys. It was like my first time. I guess just don't stop start running and the first hill might be 400 and it turns and it turns and it's hot and I'm thinking this is the first run surely I can stop I'm going to get better at this by the end of the preseason. and just as I was about to give up on myself Wayne Bennett said don't even fucking think about it he's standing behind a tree like a praying mantis it's like a big it's like a big praying but then I realized don't give in on yourself and that's all he wanted to see the guys I'll give in and then after that, he started run with me. He goes, come to my place. And there was this track and he made me run and run. He goes, don't ever give, give in on yourself. Don't stop. And I just kept on running. And until I knew when I was doing that run, just don't stop. That's all he wanted. Just don't stop. And then you end up beating that guy. And once you do it, because once you give up once, it's easy to keep on giving up. Yeah. I would have given up three or four times on that run. Yeah. But when I didn't give up once, because he told me not to think about it. And I'm sure that I'm just waiting for him, because he must have known the track. So he's going to walk down at the next tough hill to see whether I was going to stop there. So Brisbane trained really hard, and they had a lot of skill as well. They did have, I believe, the best player in the game at the time, and that was Alan Langer. Yeah. How, how you spoke about Wayne Bennett? How highly do you do you rate him? Very high. I think Wayne, if I put him in a in a school teacher category. Brian Smith teaches you out of the textbook. Wayne Bennett teaches the individual and the family. So he goes back into your family and knows that that round hole goes there, that square hole goes there. From the start of the podcast with the Steve Renouf, he knows exactly who you are, who your parents are, what makes you tick. Mm. So he used to ring my mum to see how I was feeling. Brian Smith bagged my mum. Mm. Or said, is she going to help you? Not bag, but he brought yeah, up yeah. that. Wayne Bennett used to ring my mum. Mm. Two different theories, isn't it? Now you know why he's successful. So he yeah. knows what makes the player tick more than the player. Mm. But he didn't know that I knew because he said, Mum makes it, but Mum's not going to tell. I'm going to say I'm a favourite son, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, that's, so if Wayne Bennett knows that detail about me, my dad and what I'm doing and my brother and my sisters and all that, and my nieces and my nephews, well, of course. He's going to know about every other player, isn't he? Yeah. So that's so that's so that's the difference. 
you know, like a Sir Alex Ferguson, who's a man manager by the sounds of it. Yeah. He's not a soccer coach. Mm. I'm not sure Sir Alex came up with the greatest game plans ever. But he knew that, but he knew what made that player tick and he knew what to get the best out of that player. And I think Wayne's always said to me, the best coaches are the best recruiters. I think he knew talent. He had a great mind be, um, with Cyril Connell. I remember he and Wayne used to sit there and argue about Petro Sivanasiva because I'd go watch the young kids. Wayne goes, I don't know what you see in that kid. And old Cyril was such a wise old fellow. He played halfback for Australia. He'd go, Wayne, he'll play more first grade games in the front row. And there was Glenn Lazarus and Shane Webke at the time. Wow. And Andrew G. And there was Brad Thorne that was dabbling yeah. in the front row. And he picked a guy who was a centre that come into the back row then it was going to be... 46 tests for Australia or whatever it is. So, yeah, you know, he, he had a great eye and they'd bounce a bit off each other as well. You sp another person you spoke about there, Alfie, w what set him apart? Because I, I guess, you know, some of the younger younger listeners or younger watchers of this would, would just know Alfie from, you know, the, the his stories about him and the, the, he's the guy that runs the yellow ship <laughs> for the yeah. Coast. Yeah. But what, what set him apart? Probably the most competitive guy I've ever seen once the game started and had a fear of letting his teammates down. The only thing Alf loved was being loved by his teammates. That's what drove him. So he always talks about the camaraderie, but Alf, I remember I'm sitting there, the first ever game I'm playing with Alf, he starts spewing and it's the nerves, not from his ability, but he didn't want to let his teammates down. So um, I think his natural ability... His will to win, um, his first ever state of origin, Wayne and Wally Law said he was too small and didn't want him. They wanted a bloke by the name of Laurie Spina. So he had, so he had some external <laughs> sort of motivation, I suppose, of, from, from, from within and the people that were helping him along the journey. Um, and he's a humble guy from Ipswich where his dad was a train driver and he had that great connection with Kevy Walters and when I say Elf, I can't say Elf without Kevy because Elf was this natural guy that just wanted to attack all the time. He just wanted to attack everything and Kevy would be saying, no Elf, we need to go here, no Elf, <laughs> no Elf there. And it was a great team because, you know, Elf just would see someone tired and thinks, I'll just take him on, but Kevy goes, the team needs this Elf. Yeah. You know, where, um, but... Plenty of times he told us all to shut up and he backed himself and there are all those amazing moments. And I think, when I think of Elf and those great halfbacks, he changed the game, as in the strip, that rule got changed because of Alan Langer. The little grubber, like the in-goals, because his kicking game was so good, they you know, like they made this, like the in-goal smaller. Mm. And there's probably something else, probably height rules or something, <laughs> or weight, because Alan Langer would have never <coughs> played, but... Elf's, Elf's one of those, he's probably, I always say, he's won more games for the Broncos than any other player. Yeah. I always wonder when you get someone like that and first and it is the same and they tell the story of like, oh, all these people told me I was too small. I always think, do you ever wonder if they did that for a reason? To like get that burning desire into it. They'll, they'll, it's almost like the man management that we speak about. Like if someone yeah. tells you, mate, you're too small, you're never going to make it, then the, that sets in to be like, too small am I? So if, they if they never hear that message, if they like just, you know, s you know, sleepwalking through life going, oh, no one's ever told me I'm not yeah, going to make gonna it. I'm just going to rely on my natural. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe Elf, that could be right because Wayne Bennett is a master at that mm. kind of stuff. Like the 90, like, bullshitting about getting the game plan and that's when Elf said St George can't play. They never got the game plan. Wayne just made it up mm. and bagged all of his own players and said, this is what St George are going to do to you. So that's, that, so that's a master stroke. Maybe Wally and Wayne did conjure that up. I've never thought of that. But I know with Jonathan Thurston, he was offered to the Broncos and all and they all said no. The only side that said yes was the Bulldogs. Okay, well, may maybe, though, if it wasn't for those people saying, no, you're too small, oh, like that wouldn't have inspired them to be the great players that they are. They're absolutely outstanding. John, like Jonathan Thurston, I remember playing against him and I was really late in my career and there's a skinny little kid and he had shoulders like a milk arrowroot, fair dinkum. Mm -hmm. like he just had shoulders like Humpty Dumpty. 
and the headgear was the biggest thing on him, you know, and he would go out there and he'd throw his body in front of you and he was so courageous and then he worked really hard. Like, I always say for the Cowboys, there was trap doors on the field. I've never seen a guy compete as hard as him in a game of rugby league, Jonathan Thurston. If there's a play on, there's a chance of him making a tackle or catching the ball, he's within the five metre radius. I just wonder how much those those setbacks led to someone like his marvellous career. Well, how many did you have? You would have had to have motivation to yeah, play the way you did. Yeah, not, not, yeah, a, a few, but, yeah, I don't know, just a, just a thought about the, the smaller guys in particular. You hear it a lot, like in in a lot of sports, oh, too small, you're too, too slow. Small, you're too, yeah, you're not gonna you're not gonna make it. And then that becomes the, the inspiration. What here we go. What made James so this is the thing. What makes James Graham come out to Australia? I, I You've got to, everything in England. I had to come and answer the question. Sorry? I had to come and answer the question about what if. So I got exposed to Australia when I was fifteen. I'd never been on a plane before, came here. I was like, Oh, this is pretty good, kinda like it. Hard for me to admit, being a proud Englishman. Anyway, let's not judge me for that. And then it got to a point in my career and I was like, well, if I don't go, I'll always wonder. So I didn't want to get to an age where I'd look back and go, I wonder what life would have been like if I'd have gone and tested myself. So Did I had people like Morley, their success out here? It look, it Gareth was, Ellis it, was going? Yeah, Gareth Ellis had already been here. Um, Sam Burge was here, but for me that was irrelevant. For me, Sam only just got here, didn't he? Yeah, for me that was irrelevant. For me, it was more, I need to go and figure it out for me because I can't, I, I can't look back, or I don't want to look back at 35, 40, 50 years of age and go, hmm, what would have, what would have happened? So I went and answered that question. Why the Bulldogs? Um, because at the time it seemed like a, a good move. There was a couple of options, but I feel the Bulldogs was, was the best option. Who were the other options? Uh, don't want to say. See, I get a bit disappointed. I think Sam was maybe offered to Brisbane or a couple of the boys, maybe Andrew G mm. and a couple of the guys <coughs> got told there's a kid that wants to go to Australia. His name's mm. Sam Burgess. I mean, oh... Just didn't jump on it because yeah. didn't know enough about him. But and you and Gareth Ellis had a good and Adrian Morley was another one. Mm. He was the, a great the, well, the, there's a huge, uh, huge talent pool in England, especially for forwards. Um, but probably going back to then, it, you know, you can understand why perhaps some people would have looked at the English competition and gone, I don't know. What what makes an English forward so tough? Well, they're not all. But I guess... I saw, mate, well, when you play against England, mm. that's the only thing I've played. I think I played St. Helens in the world. And they had... Um, it's Skullthorpe. Skullthorpe, yeah. He, he's I was out of that game. He's a good player. Mm. He's when played, you played the World Club Challenge. Yeah, World Club Challenge in 2001. Mm. It was, I was cold. out of that game. At Bolton, Reebok Bolton, Stadium. Yeah. Reebok Stadium. Wasn't that great. But that was my first ever time as the official Broncos captain. Because Kevin right. had retired, yeah. So we won, and Kevy should have come back and played as the captain, but he didn't want to. I wouldn't have wanted to have done a preseason either for no, one game. No, yeah, yeah, for one for game. For one game, no. No. But, um, yeah, Sculthorpe was a great <coughs> player. Yeah. And I remember, I think we got off to a lead, and then they started coming back and playing over in England. I know how once the crowd get behind yeah. them, they're coming, mm. and the balls start popping. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then the, it sticks, and we just got to hang in here. we got to kick long, and let's just get them in the corner. And the more they come off their own trial line, the better we're going to be. And I turned around to give my first speech as Broncos captain because I heard so many of them. I've turned around, and all the boys are like that <laughs> in a hard hole because we've come from 33 yeah, degrees yeah, come from to, the, yeah. to like playing in two degrees and sleet, and they had their arms folded, and they were shaking. Yeah, deaf ears that, that <laughs> night. I think it was deaf ears for my whole career, actually, trying to tell Oh, dear. Hey, just um, on the Broncos and, and your great mate, Kevy. Yeah. Where do you think they're at now? Like, this season's been... <sighs> well, last season was obviously... I Just looking at it, and I don't go back to training. I don't go to anybody's training, actually, but um, I didn't realise the hole that Brisbane was in. You know, um when Wayne left the first time, 
it was okay and we had some young kids coming through and that was a young Gillette and McCulloch and all that and this talent pool was still there. And then if it's fallen away really bad of late and Wayne coming back and, you know, he's had troubles with the powers to be in the direction of the club and then uh, Anthony Seabolt, let's not go into that, but I thought that was a huge mistake, a rookie coach going to such a big club and Kevy going back there, I know that he knows the DNA and how bad the club was. They used to train across the road from me and I watched the standards that all the things that I fell in love with the club or I was shocked when I went there and the price that you had to pay to put on a Broncos jersey and they weren't being ticked. So Kevy last year I think won seven games so they had a really hard pre-season and the players started whinging about how hard the pre-season, telling anybody who would have listened, but not the coach. Yeah. You know what I mean? They don't go to the boss. They tell all the weak people on the mm. on the perimeter what's happening. And then um, I think where they were at to where they are now, I thought that's where they were going to finish. From where they were a month ago or five weeks ago, I'm disappointed. Yeah. You know what I mean? But to if you take out the last month and you put that in the middle – you know, and go, and then they come home yeah. on a seven-game run. We go, God, gee whiz, those couple of games in the middle mm. weren't that good. But if we put it at the end, we go, geez, that's disappointing. So I thought that they were um, a top eight to ten side. Mm. You know, like that's where I had them in in that bracket. Um, and because not that long ago, people were talking about top the four. window. Yeah. top four and yeah. oh they're in they're in a window now yeah. like the, I, I thought I had I had thought the window might be you know two or three years down the track but they can't people, do it with a rookie fullback a rookie five eight and a rookie number nine no one can do it no one and that's yeah. what people have overlooked they got Jake Turpin Corey Pakes and Billy Walters they've got Tessie New who's so small the Cowboys isolated him with bombs so when I watch Brisbane I watch them really close it's my old club so I watch them really close and they've got, once they got worked out, you know, and last year they make the finals with the games they've won. Mm. Last year they make mm. the finals, you know what I mean? And the year before that they make the finals. I think three times Brisbane have made the finals in the past eight years. They've played finals winning less games than what they won this year. Yeah. So I think it's a successful year. I really do from where they're at. But if they don't improve 25% next year, it's a disappointment. Yeah. And that will put them in about fifth spot, you would think, you know, between sixth and fifth. And that's all year. And then the bonus is if they can get to that next level. Do you think the players there are too pampered? I think they – yeah, I do. I think they, they, they train out of a $25 million facility that has never won a trophy. They need to go back over to the old shed that we trained out of where and six yeah. trophies have been won. That's yeah. that's just my opinion and that's not being old school. I think you've got to earn the right to live in the new house if you haven't built it. And I think they wear that Broncos brand and the reason I wore that Broncos brand is because Wally Lawson wore that jersey. I know who wore that jersey. And the reason when Wally Lawson, he's the most important signing, he and Gene Miles, Wally's just, just above him and then when he signed... Every kid in Queensland wanted to wear that jersey, right? And then from that moment on, they had to pick. And then slowly, you know, with the Cowboys getting better, the Titans, Redcliffe coming in, the scouts going and, you know, yeah. picking areas. It, like, it has been picked apart, you know, in the last 10 or 15 years, but they still get the pick of the state. And the guys don't want to pay the price. I think they feel that once they get to the Broncos, if that's their goal, that they play for the Broncos, not win trophies for the Broncos. There's there's yeah. something there. Oh, if I want to make the Olympics, you're never going to win a medal. If you want to win a gold medal, if that's your focus, that's your focus. Yeah. I think a lot of those guys want to play for the Broncos. And then I think shopping themselves around too. And I know that we all shop. Like I work in the media now and, you know, we all do it for money. We don't do it um, for free. So I get that part of it. But in my era, no one – like the good players – like Glenn Lazarus's, Glenn Lazarus, Web Keys, they didn't chop themselves around. There was yeah. no, yeah. there was no talk of their, their pay packet 
for the negotiations in the paper and no matter who it is, no matter if you say that it doesn't affect you, I think it does. I think it affects the fans. They boot him. Yeah. And I don't like the way players go, oh, he has a right, it's his career. What about your career and you wanting to win and getting together and driving? Because mm. I was in England and we were together one day and Shane Webke was negotiating. He came to me and said, what do you think? I said, if you stay together and Lockie, if us three and Wendell was there, mm. if we all stay together, we will win grand finals. Yeah. And we all said yes. And then Wendell went to rugby about a week later when he came <laughs> home. <laughs> they, they were all on my phone. I've never told the story. They were all on my phone call, right? Because they, you know I mean? Because they were... <laughs> They were all negotiating. We'd won the grand final. We'd won the World Cup. They got on my phone, mate. My phone bill was huge back in the day when you didn't yeah. know the turn off data yeah, roaming, yeah. roaming England. Shane Webke spoke to Wayne for about 45 minutes or an hour, got his deal done without a manager. Wendell got it. Wayne goes, what do you want? I said, we've spoken. This is what we all want. Wayne goes, done. Deal done. Wendell, tear. We're all hugging. We all had a bit. It was only us four after the World Cup in this bar. I don't know what time it was. It was an afternoon. Might have been the next day or even the day after. And we had this moment that we all put a pack together. We put the so band there was together. You, Darren Lockyer, Shane Webke, and Wendell Saylor. I said if we, because Wendell had the Lottie Takiris and all those, and the Chris Walkers. He had those guys eating mm. out of the palm of his hand. Webby had Thorny and Petro, and that was his realm. And I had the young Dane Carlos. We had this group, and Lockie would have trained the halves. We thought we had this. And Wendell come back and then sign for Rugby Union because someone goes, geez, it'd be a good battle between you and Jonah Lomax. So when I fronted Wendell, I said, Wendell, you said you were going to stay with us. He goes, oh, yeah, but I got a chance to play against Jonah Lomax. Well, he did. The only time they came together was to shake each other's hand after the game. I could have met... I could have organised a meet and greet. I could have organised a dinner with Wendell and Jonah. They never come head to head. Yeah. Like they were never going to come in there. <laughs> so, oh, well. so there you are. So, we're, 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 I think the, the plan is we've got Dell on in a couple of weeks. So, we'll, we'll be asking them more. Ask about him about, it. and that's 100% true. All right. So, he made a pact and he reneged. Yes. And then mm. I was in, I ended up going, coming back to Australia for a wedding, fly back over. I was in New York, rang mum, hey mum, how are you going? She goes, Wendell Saylor just signed for rugby. Union. <laughs> I said, Mum, don't worry about it. It's just all paper talk. We made, we made a pat. I was at Mum. goes, no, no, no. I said, Mum, you don't know what you're talking about. Just relax. I get home. He'd already signed. Oh, Wendell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's a, he's a character. One of a kind. <clears throat> he, he sure is. I was at a sportsman's dinner with him the other day. Oh, he's got four personalities. Oh, mate. That, and talk which, about, So talk which one come out? <laughs> It may, he was in, he, he was the entertainer, but you know, the the the, the guy that the sort of the compare, the, the, the guy interviewing us, like Wendell didn't listen to him. He asked him a question about something and he just went off on a different tangent. Talking about Wayne or someone. Like, he's like, oh, what do you think of the, what do you think of the Broncos game in the weekend? He's like, oh, I'll tell you what. Well, when I was at Ruby Union, he was like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm there like, oh. <laughs> he didn't actually know that. He just, but you know, there's no, there's no break in his, no. in his rhythm. He's just, no, no. he's, <laughs> a, he's a fantastic human being. Della. I, I remember when he went over to Rugby Union because he was saying, "Mate, you enjoy Penrith. I'll be in Paris." And he kept on saying, "You yeah. know, like, <laughs> mate, you're being manly. I'll be in like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all these, okay, cool, whatever." Anyway, when he went to rugby, he was always on the bench. So I just said, "Mate, how you going, China?" He says, what do you call me China for? I said, you're very expensive and always on the bench. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't get it. So, <laughs> uh, but you know, uh, a good China sits on the mm. bench, yeah. But uh, he, he's a, he's, he was so good to play with. He, yeah, he, I can he, imagine. He you. gave himself every nickname. Um, and in his prime, in his prime, he'd come off the wing. When it first just came out where they'd come in mm. and they'd eat meters. Like when I first came, wingers were there to score tries. Wait till you get past the ball and winger in. The old yeah. winger in off the tap. That was it. Well, Wendell sort of changed the game with hit ups. And he'd come in, he'd do these great hit ups. He'd have late footwork, he'd get between guys, great leg power. He'd make 10 or 15 meters every run. And he'd say, wait there, boys, I'll be back in a moment. And he'd just <laughs> and he'd jog back out to the wing. He'd come back in. He wasn't good on kick chase. He never, mate, they'd kick it and he'd, and I'd always find touch on mm. his wing or whatever because he wouldn't do any of those things. But I tell you what, when he'd cart the ball, there was no one that could cart it like yeah, him. Yeah, he bought a lot. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm. And I was well, only a trainer. That's what it comes down, like we spoke about the team, right? Absolutely. But 
I'll tell you when, so if everybody thinks he's selfish, in 2000, Nike brought out this great silver boot. And it was the Olympics was going to be here, the silver suit with Kathy Freeman, mm. they were tying all the athletes. They gave him the silver boot, and I'm superstitious. I said, Wendell, don't wear it. He goes, I'm going to wear it. He goes, Nike, want me to wear it. I said, wear it at the World Cup. It's going to be a big stage. You can wear it in the World Cup final. Just don't wear it at grand final day. It was the first day grand final, 100,000 at the Olympic Stadium. Mm. My brain, after playing at St. George's, Changa Langlands, white boots. Oh, yeah, yeah. Changa yeah. Langlands, white boots. Changa Langlands, white boots. When I go, I can wear these boots, I'll rock these boots, bait. Big Dell will be in the house, Dell, Show Dell or whatever he's naming mm. himself. To his credit, um, we flew down here. We had the grand final breakfast on Thursday. Kevy Walters goes, you want to go have a beer, Gordy? And I was really nervous. So the 97 grand final, we were 98. We won against the Dogs. In 2000, it was like my first grand final when it was on my watch. And I felt really nervous. We were playing the Roosters. And he was wanting to have a beer because we just have four or five beers and come back. So we went, yeah, so we went down to the Orient and we had four beers. One more, yep, one more. Five, six, seven, eight. We probably had about ten beers. Got up, did the grand final breakfast, walked down on Sunday. But that's when we talked Wendell Sailor into not wearing the boots. And he goes, I promise you boys I won't wear the boots, which was good because the team asked him. But then on Sunday we get up for breakfast. Kevy passes me in the hallway. He goes, Wayne's found out that we had a beer. I said, shit. I said, what are you tell him? He goes, I told him it's bullshit and they're trying to get at us. I said, right. Walked down to the breakfast. Wayne goes, what about this shit? Look at them trying to get into us. Eight Broncos caught having a beer on Wednesday night. Wayne, don't worry about it. I said, mate, they're always trying to get in there. I said, don't let them get under your skin. Anyway, we went out there. We beat the Roosters. We're driving back to the airport, get on the plane. Wayne goes, what about those assholes today trying to say that? I said, Wayne, we're all on the piss. <laughs> who was it? I said, him, 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 <laughs> him, him and him. I told him and I was there. And he goes, who was the ringleader? I said, oh, well, I didn't know what to on. I said, we just wanted to go over here. I said, we were nervous. He goes, well, you got the job done. Okay. Um, that was it. <laughs> but, that, but, that, but that was under Wayne's watch, mm. you know. It was, it's, um, and I don't know why, because I wouldn't have done it for a normal game. Yeah. But it was just, I think the pressure that I was feeling subconsciously of, on the other grand finals, Alf and Steve Renouf and those guys, I was I was the co-pilot. I, mm. I was sitting in the back seat. But when it was my turn to shine, there was more pressure on letting... Well, you let the state down, you know? Yeah. Well, like you said, you, you got the job done. Lucky we're only playing the Roosters. You should have just said Wayne. No. I, Wayne, I, I, I was only going out to make sure no one else was out. <laughs> no, that was Elf. Another yeah. time, another time, like there was curfew. No one was supposed to go out. So Wayne got wind of it. All of us are in cabs. We're all out. He caught Elf in a lift, and Elf goes, "Wayne, I think these blokes have gone out." He goes, "Let's get the key." So Wayne goes down, gets the key. Check every room. Elf dobbed us all. Yeah. <laughs> elf dobbed us. Elf dobbed everybody. That is some. That That's is elf. Some, that is some quick thinking as well. Yeah. So Elf got caught in the lift, going to come down to the taxi, oh, and he dobbed us in. And then um, I think the Raiders have a similar story. And then Laurie goes, "How did we get caught?" Tim Sheens knew there was a lady on the reception, so he goes, "Excuse me, love. If you see any players come back in, can you just ask them?" Sign this for your son, oh. and and then did, and Tim Sheen's got it the next morning and got all the Raiders players. Oh, that's brilliant! That's brilliant. That is it? brilliant. So see, there's a couple of the old coaches who, who are still around. Mm. But with so you can get away with it now, boys. Don't sign any yeah, orders. Yeah, yeah. You're going to be hated. Yeah. That, that Benji Marshall didn't sign my order. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who didn't sign it? Oh dear, um, mate. Into you, you retired due to a, a pretty bad neck injury. Um, you, you spoke about already having a year out. How did you find that um, that mo movement, that transition out of the the game? Yeah, um, no, it was fine. The neck is I got a narrowing of the spinal canal, so where I think normal ones say I think thirteen, mine's nine, so there was less room for the spinal cord. So I was like the disc slid forward, um, gave me a lot of complications. I think once I had the surgery and I couldn't train, basically I couldn't do the same damage at training, like getting to the same contact. 
because there was a use by date on your body then. Mm. Um, there is a use by date, but in sport, it just comes a little bit quicker. Um, it's like, I suppose, taking a bit of armour off someone. You know, like, I lost my arm because when I used to play, I never used to think about it. Then I started to think about it, you know, who I'm running at, what's... And then you lose that impact. You lose that that second that makes you better than the other guy or beat him or get the offload away. So um, I should have retired then and there, like I really should have. Um, I went to Wayne one day and said, I I don't think I can cut the muscle anymore. And he said, look, I probably need you to hang around a little bit longer because the, the squad was young and mm. I did. And I loved the club as well. You know, I mean, like what the club had given me, I didn't want to walk away and I knew that I could do a job but not to the standard that... I wanted to play at when I wanted to play, so. Um, but it was fun. like it was fun once, once realizing that you got to do a different job, like that's the funny thing. Once you realize that you got to do a different job, swallowing that was harder than getting through the games and the injury. I suppose. One of the the roles you did take up was NRL board member. Yeah. What What was that about? Like, um, I was talking. Like what, to what, what was the like, can you run me through a typical day being on the NRL board? Or a typical Pretty week? much like it now. Pretty much. It's the same. Um, I was talking to a guy, he was the boss um, at the time, which was John Hardigan. He was the News Limited boss. I think it's Michael Miller now. And we we're just talking about footy, about, you know, where you wanted to be and that. And he goes, if we can get you on the board as a player, I think they had the vision. Obviously, now there's a commission with Wayne mm. Pierce, and whether it's rule changes or whatever, the game's like evolved off the field than what it was and when I was there. But I went on with Katie Page and uh, she's Jerry Harvey's wife. And one thing that I'm really proud of, we got the one community and there was a lot of work that we did off the field. And, yeah. and like she was the catalyst for that. But um, sitting on that side of the fence on the pie and what the game gets and, you know, going to get that big blue chip sponsor and know how player behaviour yeah. really affects that. And the stigma of everybody's tarred with the one brush mm. sort of thing. So, um, but being on the board um, was interesting. I bet it was. Getting, getting every party, whether it's Queensland Rugby League, New South Wales Rugby League, Country Rugby League, NRL to the ARL, getting it all on one page. Um, the clubs, there's so many different tribes. That's what makes our game so great. But getting all those tribes one day... Hopefully, before I die, that rugby league is one and we all can just sing some yeah. hymns from the same page would be fantastic. I would understand the World Cup, trying to get Australia and all those countries together mm. to make sure that it's successful and everybody gets the right amount like, of time. Have and the stuff. game's best interest at heart. Where Not I, yours. I, yeah, I, I, I fear that a lot of it is governed by self interest, though. Not the game's best interests. Of course. And that's natural, but it's a shame. Yeah, and how do we change that? I think it's slowly changing. Mm. Like I really do, and I think um, at the moment, I, I actually love Peter Volandis. He's a good fella. I, 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 I like the way he operates. Yeah, uh, of many months. Um, I, I, like, I love the way he operates. I think to get a game back on through COVID, um, changing the rules, I think the spectacle's fantastic. Um, grand finals I think for a long time we shouldn't apologise for being rugby league like we shouldn't have to apologise and I know a commissioner um, and they've been appointed and no one's congratulated them she goes oh rugby league you know and then they turn but we should never apologise for who and Pete doesn't for mm. who we are and I love the way he stands up because we're actually there's a lot of really good people in our game that have done a lot of amazing things on and off the field yeah um, and we shouldn't be tied with the one. And I love the way Pete sticks up for us. Yeah. We need a bit more Pete. St. Pete. St. Peter. St. Peter. Mm. In terms of the, the future for you, Gordon, obviously you have a, a, a role within the media now. You have a um, a role at the Gold Coast Titans. What What's the future looking like for, for um, Gordon Tallis? What, 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 asp what aspirations do you have at the, at the moment? It's a really good question, Jimmy. I think um, my wife sacrificed a fair bit, you know, because I'm away so much. So 
Um, I'm really lucky to be involved. Like when I when I finished rugby league, I thought if I was a development officer in a junior program, helping kids, promoting the game in the bush or whatever, that was probably the peg that was going to be the most comfortable for me to be in, just being out and then to jump and being on boards and Cowboys board, which I enjoyed, and to be where I'm at now. I love my role in the media. I love my time at Fox Sports. I love sitting on the couch with Maddie Fletch and Heine. Like, I really do like that. Um, Triple M on the Sundays. It's it's actually... I actually enjoy going to work. So that part, I re- like, I just... I look forward to it. So I never want that to end. But, of course, all good things have to come to an end. And um, I think I might dabble in getting back into the game. And you say you don't want to, but I think... I think our game's lost the way from trying to be too nice. And I think, you know, listening to these coaches and all that, like humans, as I said before, they haven't. We've all been made the same way for the last 100 years. And, you know, I think that um, I'd like to get back and for my own sake go in there because when I talk about the game or the players or the kids playing the game or the tough men that are playing the game, I want to spend some more time with the current group of players because I've made... I've made sure that I've kept the distance so I can have my role in the media. Yeah. So hopefully they don't take it the wrong way. But if I'm close to someone, I'm never going to say anything bad mm. to them. So having my distance has allowed me to be... Um, authentic in the media. Yeah. Authentic to Triple M and, yeah. and, and Fox because I don't have any friends and I've certainly taken the player's hat mm. off now and try to put on what I say like, a pub chat, you know, mm. like you know, like those to stand up with my mates and where yeah. I grew up, and I try to think of you know under eights to under eighteens and all the chats that I have around. So maybe getting back involved with a, you know, whether it's Queensland or Queensland under nineteens or something, you know, just go, just dabble on helping someone out. I think I don't know. That's maybe a, an itch, but I don't know. I don't know what I want to do. I want to go to England for the World Cup. That's what I'm really looking forward to. Do you have any good watering holes I can get? Oh, uh, plenty. Don't worry about that. If there's watering holes you need, I can point you in the right direction. I want to go to a real old-fashioned pub. I'll English pub. take you to one in Liverpool. Um, good friend of mine runs one in Liverpool, I'll, I'll tell you. Am I safe there? Yes. Okay. Because yes. they're pretty tough in Liverpool, are they? Wasn't you, it the old wolfy type of... Uh, if you want trouble... You can find it you easy. You can find it, yeah. But Real easy? Yeah, it wouldn't be difficult. <laughs> but this, <laughs> this pub's nice. Pub. Right, no, no. You know you can find trouble. See, I could come well, to Sydney and know where you can't, you can't find trouble. In Brisbane, I don't know where to find it. But you know where to find it in Liverpool? Yeah. Wow. But, yeah, we won't, we won't send you there. Send you. <laughs> Why do you have to think about it for? Send you to the nice part. Um, <laughs> So ju- just going back to that, because you, you, I've heard you say you want to be, you, you want to take some more responsibility for what's happening at the Titans. Yeah, is that where you naturally could could see it going? In, I, I know you did like a specialist forwards role, coach at with South. I is really that enjoyed that. that. You, yeah, but that is, it's not, it's not that full pressure. It's just what you know and yeah. what you know well. I. I Russell Crowe was really good to me. He didn't really give me a title. That's what the media, that's what yeah. That's what I say. Oh, look, I'm just helping out the forwards because uh, basically it was just around the group. If I was chatting to a centre or a winger and what I've learned, I could pass on your knowledge or help them out if they were struggling and that. And I've got a three-year-old now. I've got a, you know, like an 11-year-old. I've got an 18 and 17. So to get back in, more importantly, it's about to find out what kids are doing these days as well mm. and the... And the psych of them, because the psych of me and you or Sam Burgess is pretty much on the same page. Slightly different, but pretty much I know what textbook you mm. read out of. And to watch these new kids that I tend to watch and think, why aren't they doing that? So I've got to unravel it a little bit. And the more I can go and work with them and realise what makes them tick or what's this or that, um, I'm curious. Because I don't understand, like, and I say, I don't understand, like, I love the game. I don't, I seriously don't understand that. When you get paid to work, you go work and do your best job possible. Mm. I just, I, 
And that part I don't understand. Yeah. I know some days you don't do your job mm. as good as you did the day before and you get yeah. the patches and it becomes easier and stories and all that. Like, I understand all that. But there's got to be more to, but, oh, we just didn't turn up today. And we've spoke about it on this air. <laughs> oh, you know, we just yeah. got, mate, we got ambushed. Um, I think the game was starting at three o'clock yeah. all week. <laughs> yeah, we've known. <laughs> we've been knowing that. It's been penciled yeah. in. You've had to warm up. You know that then there's a two-minute mm. warning and... They haven't changed the time yeah. on you. Someone hasn't knocked on the door and you in your pyjamas, mm. have they? No. <laughs> it's a party. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Surprise. I'm not Surprise. Yeah, We're I'm here playing rugby league. <laughs> yeah, it's no. like, yeah. So, I don't know. Just, yeah. just something. And I think because I'm curious to find out. Mm. I'm. You're not, are you? <laughs> I, no, part, part of me would, would love to. Would absolutely love to. But I'm just fearful of what it would turn me into. It's not going to turn you into anything that you had. That, that you don't know. No, I know, but I just don't control. know. I don't know if I want to be that person anymore. Like I say, I've been mad. I, I know who I was, and I've tried to burn him off and bury a bit of him. And I, I don't know. I don't want him coming back to life. I wanted to meet that guy. No. That he, guy? Yeah. That guy I wanted to, <laughs> that guy I wanted to meet so many times. He's um, He's been put away, Gordon. <laughs> um, can he come out? <laughs> one time <laughs> Maybe about five, six schooners in. He, you can bring him. Does he come yeah, out? He can do. Just one speech. He can do. I just right. want one speech. <laughs> um, um, when you were tired, right, it, like now a lot of people retire and go and do boxing. I know you yeah. like to box. You spoke yeah. about the training. Yeah. Have you ever been offered to fight? Yeah, heaps. Yeah, a few times. Um, I'm good mates with Chock, so I got offered... A few times, a lot of money, but um, for one is with my neck, I can't spar. Ah, so so like when they when they fuse my like the, when they fuse my spine, the disc above and below my fusion are moving in the same direction. So it's too dangerous. Well, well, yeah. Well, for me to go spar right, so to to know chalk for him to fight ten rounds, he spars a hundred. So you, get, so you get punched in the head mm. for 100 rounds to set yourself up for a six-round fight. So it's not the f- – yeah, I would have loved – like if I was fine and you're in your prime and it was going to get you fit through the off-season and uh, go out there and have a bit of fun, absolutely. Because I really – but part of me is yes now, but I'm saying that, but at the time I think it takes a lot of courage for oh, like, me. Like, like Anthony Mundine and Gallon and all those guys that. But M- M- Mundine actually, he didn't just do some. He wasn't just some cameo, and he was like a. He, he went full time boxer. He was a full time boxer. I think the bloke it. had had thirty fights. Yeah, his first fight. He wasn't just fighting other footy players either. He was fighting. Pros. I think his fifth fight was Australian champion. His yeah. tenth fight was for a world title. Yeah, that's. Yeah, that's, that's a serious boxer. That's, that's well, I'm not talking that. I'm talking, yeah. you know, like what we see there. Oh, the slap and give. Yeah. Yeah, but part of me, you know, part of me is um, disrespecting a sport. As, does that make sense? I know exactly you? what you're saying, yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, like, I'm not. And you get someone like a Jeff Fennick and a Costa Zoo and Tim Zoo and Mundine that took it up seriously. Mm. And they go, I'm just going to do it for money or, or do it for a bit of fame or five minutes. Mm. Um, if it's for a charity and all the money, you know, like those mm. fight for life and it's a, yeah. like, um, and I did get offered one of those um, and I said, yes, yeah. I'll fight and it was going to be an all black. I said, just make sure he's drank as many schooners as I have in the last, because I think I was 35 or 38 at yeah. the time. So I'll fight him, but make sure he's hasn't done any training, hasn't had any fights and I'll fight him. I don't care how much he sparred mm. or whatever because that didn't yeah. me. But I don't get someone that's, because you get beaten on, exp- like with those fights, the more I know that the more experience they have and the more training they've done, they beat you. Mm. Like they're not they're not an Anthony Mundine style fight. Mm. There's just a pub brawl with gloves on and without the schooners. Seriously, like there's not much technique going in. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. like Sonny Bill is Solomon Hamano and Sonny have probably got to it as like with a bit of boxing ability. Anthony Mundine, um, of course, the rest of them, um, no disrespect, they you know, just Pub brawlers, sluggers. Yeah, but that's it's great. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It's like, fantastic to watch. Like Gallant, like and Gallant to do what he's done, and I think it was Mark Hunt and mm. Big Daddy Brown. Yeah, and 
Justice Hooney, like mm. man, he thought and Justice Hooney's a he's mm. a proper bot like yeah, he's, yeah, a, yeah. he's a very skillful. To, to be bot. fair to Gal Gal and he, he admits what he is, he's I'm a prize yeah. fighter. Yeah. I'm not in this game to win a no to win a belt. And and, a, and I don't yeah, you know, and Gal, I think just watching him, I don't think things come easy to him. You know, you watch someone like Sonny, like yeah, you know, like it's just natural yeah. Like, yeah. like Sawali, you think if he he probably can throw punches and you see someone else, you go, No, they've got to work really yeah. hard on their catching and their running and their footwork mm. and their agility where um, I think Gallon's worked really hard to get to where he has. So mm. kudos. Yeah, good on him. Yeah. Well, Gordy, um, I just want to say again, a huge thank you for joining us here on, on the buy round, mate. I can say it's, um, it's a crazy journey for me, having watched you as a kid from afar, uh, 14,000 kilometers away and w wanting to get the boots because you wore them and here we are sat having a chat together it's um well jimmy it means the, a lot the respect is mutual because this is like a love and we should start singing kumbaya but when i retired there's only certain players i think that you are prepared to watch and enjoy their career and you're certainly one of them so to sit and watch you play and the way you played i talked about alan langer changing the game every front rower has tried to play like you, or every coach has tried to get them to play the way you played, which that's pretty cool. Yeah, thanks. It, it, it's actually very cool that to this day that they all try to play like you, which not bad, hey? The little English mm. kid with that curiosity. Yeah. What if I didn't come over here and change the way front row was playing in Australia? Thanks, Gordon. Cheers. Awesome. <laughs>